Okay, so let me confess. I spent the last two days sitting in front of my computer watching the live feed of General Synod. I've yet to decide if this is conducive to the health of my soul or not. And I don't really want to get into the politics here. Um, obviously, Synod elected Bishop Linda Nichols as the primate elect. Um, and at this point, the decision has been made to uphold the traditional understanding of marriage within the Anglican Church of Canada. Now, that might change because there's more motions coming forward, but that's where we are right now. And so I don't want to comment on the ins and outs of all of that. Because as this unfolds, we're going to need to hear what Archbishop Greg says about the direction of our diocese. But all last week, I've been sitting with the gospel reading and just really allowing it um, kind of to sink within me as, as soil slowly drinks in the water. And I found that as I did that, I started pondering how this passage might speak to the church, and particularly what emerged was how this passage might call to a radical unity in the church. So this sermon is going to be a little bit different than normal. It's actually going to be a little bit longer. Um, sorry, because this morning the sermon is an appeal for church unity with reflections drawn from the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, to be clear, when Jesus said this parable, he wasn't thinking about general synod in the Anglican Church of Canada. That wasn't in his mind. However, um, in fact, the early church fathers and mothers actually saw this parable as speaking about uh, the church, right? The wounded man was Christ, and the inn was the church, and the two coins were the sacraments. They saw it allegorically. So I'm not altogether departing from how this text has traditionally been understood. But how does the parable of the Good Samaritan then, how does it speak to the unity in the church? Because it's called the unity, or this prayer for unity. I have to say it is a prayer that has emerged for me over the past really several weeks, even prior to General Synod. An important understanding that we need to have is that unity is not something that we bring about by being the same. Unity is not the same as uniformity. In fact, unity is not actually about us. And the more we focus on ourselves, the more we try to force some human understanding of unity by our own actions, by our own thoughts, the more we move away from what the unity of the church is actually to be about. Why? Because we are not the creators of unity. The unity of the church, it's a gift to the church because it is held by Jesus. Jesus holds the church together. We exist in him. That is, it is only as the community of faith is together, focused on the good news of Jesus, fed by the body and blood of Jesus, and empowered by the spirit of Jesus. It's only in that way that the church can understand itself as a united, as one body, as the church or in scriptural language, in one accord. The unity of the church is a function, and it's a byproduct of the church's identity in Jesus Christ. In the journal, the Anglican Theological Review, William Stringfellow writes, the gift of unity is, in the first instance, in its origination, something which belongs to God. Jesus unites us. And this sense of unity, it's a little messy because it doesn't dismiss our differences and it doesn't dismiss our brokenness and it doesn't actually dismiss our divisions. In fact, in unity, I can, completely, I can be completely different from you iPhone to Android users, Stampeders to Rough Riders, Yahoo to Yeehaw. We can be completely opposite. And in fact, I can fundamentally think that you're wrong. And I can think that you're mistaken. But it doesn't mean that I don't love you. Because if Jesus is your Lord, and Jesus is my Lord, then together Jesus is our Lord. Unity exists with you and I, we and us, resting in the hands of Jesus Christ. 
Our expression of unity is rooted in that primary call for our lives, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. This is what we hear in the parable. The expert of the law says this to Jesus. And Jesus commends the expert of the law. Do this and you will live, Jesus says. Embody this. Live this out. This appeal to loving the Lord, which flows into love of neighbor, though, is not something that just sounds nice doctrinally, but has no practical merit. That phrase, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, this was part of the Shema, which is really kind of the Jewish creed. The Jewish people as a nation, they were asked to recite this daily because it spoke fundamentally to who they were. It was kind of this perpetual reminder that they were the Lord's people. That they were people who lived their life within the presence of the Lord before them. And that presence of God, that was to define what they were passionate about. It was to define how they thought about things. It was to define what they gave their energy to. It is to define what they avoided. It was to define how they treated each other and how they treated each other's differences. And the same is called for us. Jesus commends it to us all. And so if we are ever asked, what is the church about? Or, or what is that which unifies the church? We should say first and foremost that we love Jesus with all of our passion and prayer and intelligence and muscle. It is the foundation of everything we are. I had a conversation once with a new parishioner who asked me, um, so you are really into Jesus, aren't you? And I remember thinking, I chuckled at that question, um, but I remember thinking how sad it was that I got that question. Because how sad it was that an Anglican priest being into Jesus was somehow strange or odd. But the reality is that sometimes we have made the church about other things, about so many other things. We've made the church about social justice. And we've made the church about uh, conservative morality or politics. Or we've made the church about progressiveness and liberation. Or we've made the church about the color of the carpets. Or we've made the church about the danger of a hymn book revision. Or whatever it is. And yet some of those things are well and good. But they are not which hold the unity. They are not which create the unity. They are not which protect the unity. Because the unity of the church is held in the hand of Jesus. Jesus alone is the unity of the church. Now before we say absolutely, we need to recognize that there are radical implications of this. Again, Stringfellow says the unity of the church is given to be the content and the shape of the church's love for and service to the world. The unity of the church gives content and shape to our witness to the world. Love of the Lord leads to love of neighbor. Right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If we love Jesus, it pushes us outward. The rabbis of Jesus' time already had already linked the Shema to this command to love your neighbor as yourself, this passage from Leviticus. But there was a little bit of discussion about who the neighbor was to be. One interpretation of the day saw that that commandment in Leviticus was a call to love only your Israelite neighbors. So love your neighbor as yourself because they're pretty much like you. Which is why the expert says, well, who is my neighbor? And can I just say, I love the humanity in this. Because we do this, don't we? We try to justify what we don't need to do or who we don't need to talk to or who doesn't belong or who this doesn't apply for. Peter says, I only need to forgive like seven times, right? The expert of the law is like, so who, who can I justifiably not love? Just let me know that. But to think this way is to think that the love that we have for God that the unity that Jesus creates within the body of faith, it is only to be expressed with certain circles and with certain people, or to certain people of a certain theological outlook. It's designed for people like me. 
who look like me and think like me and vote like me. But in response to that thought, Jesus presents this parable. And the entire point is that Jesus gives the most extreme example of understanding the worth and the humanity of another person. One scholar said that to understand this parable, you need to ask yourself, is there anybody from any group who we would rather die than acknowledge? If we ever get to the point of trying to distance ourselves from a group of people, then we are stepping outside of the ethic of Jesus. And sadly, we've been doing that. I heard some comments at Synod when I was watching. And I read comments online. And I quote, Why do you people have so much hate in your heart? What made your heart go so black? How can these people call themselves Christians and vote this way? The bishops clearly don't love everyone. And even before Synod, there were statements like this. These people don't read the Bible rightly. People who agree with the marriage change don't have a right understanding of Jesus. Again, I'm not sure if spending time reading all that was good for the health of my soul. But what do those statements say about the soul of the church? When we make such statements, I believe the heart of Jesus breaks and he weeps over his church because such statements mean that we think that the unity of the church occurs when other people agree with me, with my side of the argument. Love my neighbor only as they're like me. And yes, people are hurting and people are confused I think actually everybody is hurting and everybody is confused, but if we distance ourselves from the other to deny any sort of unity in humanity or unity in faith with them, then we will never be the Good Samaritan. And we will never embody the sacrificial love that Jesus showed us on the cross. What if it is not just a group of people, what if it's the entire church lying bloody on the road, feeling beaten up by controversy and insults and mudslinging? What if all of us, regardless of what we think about a whole host of things, what if all of us are hurting? What does it mean for you to love the church the way that the Savior loves the church? The love of the Good Samaritan, it didn't try to change the wounded man. In fact, the Samaritan was willing to be inconvenienced for the sake of the good and the health and the life of the other and the proclamation of the gospel. It is that radical, it is that Christ-like, it is that I'm willing to bear the scars of the cross type of love that the unity of the church calls for. It was the radical focus on nothing but the risen Lord that made the Jewish people accept the inclusion of the Gentiles. It was the radical, self -heart, self, single-hearted focus on the love of Jesus that caused the church to take a bold step in allowing women to have a place and a voice within the community of faith. It was the radical love of Jesus that made the synod vote to limit its own power and give the self-governing indigenous church the right to exist. In each case, the community could have said, well, we disagree with you on a certain amount of things, and so you can't be a part of us. But the desire to be centered on Christ prevailed over everything. And the church was held together in the midst of disagreement, in the midst of discord, and in the history of the church, sometimes in the midst of hard, hard disagreements and fighting. What we are called to, what we need to be refocused on, is not a unity centered on ecclesial polity, not a unity centered on watered-down theological politeness or an appeal to social agency or structure or some human call for us all to think the same way. We are called to a robust and a radical understanding of unity that transcends all of our human brokenness, all of our pride, all of our arrogance, and all of our waywardness. And every single one of us are broken and prideful 
and arrogant and wayward at times. We are called to the unabashed witness of the power of Christ to unite and to heal, to testify that unity overcomes estrangement and forgiveness heals guilt and joy overcomes despair. Because even if we agree about everything that we possibly can, if we don't have that radical and robust sense of unity, we aren't being the church because we're not existing in Jesus. Love the Lord your God with all your passion and all your prayer and all your intelligence and all your muscle, living that out to people who are opposite of you. That radical call is a far weightier call than just a, being a religious soundbite. It brought the seemingly opposing Samaritan and Jewish person together, focused on something bigger than their differences. Jesus says to the expert in the law, and he says to us, go and do likewise. And before we say, yeah, but stop, we are called to stop. Because Jesus stops his sentence right there, and he doesn't give clarification. Because when it comes down to it, the unity of the church isn't something that we try to bring about by our decision making. It is something we receive by Jesus alone. It is a quality that ultimately Jesus alone will protect. Our call is to, as best we can, attempt to live it out as we are empowered by the Spirit to do. Amen.